Hello, I'm Mark Blunden and this is the Standards Tech and Science Daily podcast. Coming up, sustainable jet fuel controversy and the future of battery-powered aviation. If you're new here, make sure to hit follow and give us a rating. But first... A NASA astronaut duo marooned on the International Space Station have discovered they may not return home to Earth until 2025. Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore were only meant to be aboard the ISS for eight days, but have been stuck for over two months after thruster faults and helium leaks on the Boeing Starliner spacecraft's inaugural 25-hour outbound journey in June. NASA's working on a rescue plan for the pair using a SpaceX Crew-9 craft, but now Now they're being told they should prepare not to be home until next February. Next, a Virgin Atlantic radio ad claiming the airline was the first to fly transatlantic on 100% sustainable aviation fuel has been banned by the Advertising Standards Agency for misleading consumers that the propellant was greener than it really is. The airline says it's committed to net zero by 2050 and was using a global industry term for fossil alternative fuels. So we asked Finlay Asher from Flight Industry Environmental Campaign Group Safe Landing to clarify exactly what this type of fuel is and isn't. We don't like using this term in our organisation because it defines the fuel as definitely sustainable and actually we think a lot of it isn't. We prefer to use alternative jet fuel. Now it's generally split into two categories. There's bio fuels that's produced from biomass and electrofuels produced from electricity. The majority though is biofuels and actually the majority that's used today is waste oil and fat. This was the fuel that was used in this transatlantic flight. We don't think that is a very sustainable pathway. There's very little waste oil and fat in the world. You know in the UK we already import the majority of this from China and Malaysia because we don't have enough left here ourselves. So it's a bit of a dead-end technology. And we, we also really risk incentivising deforestation. Finley's an aerospace engineer and engine designer. And we also asked about the current picture for engine technology versus the boom in aviation demand. Well, this is what I was working on, more efficient aircraft engines and aircraft. Historically, we've been improving the efficiency of jet engines and, and aircraft. Over the past 50 years, we've got big efficiency savings. And we always talk about this. The problem is aviation growth, air traffic growth, like massively outstrips this. So we might be able to push for maybe 1% efficiency improvement per year. But the last 10 years, we were expanding by 5% per year. And, and actually, that efficiency improvement makes flying cheaper. It means more people fly. And it might even supercharge emissions. So this is something where we can't just rely on technology or on fuels and why our group says, well, actually, we need to look at other regulations that are going to control emissions. Plus the materials used and their effectiveness in cutting emissions. At an aircraft level, you can have more aerodynamic wings, you can have lighter materials, composite, carbon fibres being used instead of metals. At an engine level, you want to push for better propulsive efficiency by making the bypass ratio of the engine bigger. That's why you see jet engines that get bigger and bigger in diameter as the years progress. You also got hotter, higher pressure cores that improve the thermodynamic efficiency of the engines. We are getting into marginal gains with conventional aircraft configurations, what we call the tube and wing design. I expect that what we'll begin to see is some something called the open rotor. This is an engine that doesn't have the nacelle, the engine cowling around it. It looks more like a propeller, but it's sort of a cross between the, the turbofans that you have today and propellers that you tend to see on regional aircraft. Finley says it's startups, including the likes of Dutch firm Elysian, rather than the bigger players who are leading the way in hybrid and battery powered flight tech. You're starting to see startups like Elysia and you mentioned and a few others that are developing hydrogen like Zero Avia or Elysia, which is electric, battery electric or, or hybrid electric. Basically, this is possible. There is limits to like energy storage and weight and volume with both batteries and hydrogen that need to be worked through. That's why we, we think we definitely need to fly as efficiently as possible. While this technology is possible, it's going to take time. It's going to take probably 10, 15 years before we see anything at significant size. So that's why we need to also focus on fossil fuel powered aircraft and properly pricing those or these other technologies that are more nascent won't be able to compete. But it is really exciting. There is kind of a revolution around the corner in terms of the next kind of chapter in aviation history and design. And what Safe Landing is calling for in terms of regulatory reform. Big problem is international aviation emissions are not included in the COP process. When countries submit their emissions targets, they don't include them. We would like to see them included. We'd like to see them discussed and negotiated in the COP process and ultimately have some carbon budgets 
that's divided fairly around the planet and then also like at a national level fairly around the country to airports. A key part of that as well, it's not just carbon, it's also the non-carbon impact. So we've got contrails. We'd really like to see sort of higher emissions pricing applied particularly to transatlantic flights that tend to produce more warming contrails so that we can measure and mitigate those and pay for it. More locally, we're really interested in hybrid electric aircraft flying a bit slower so we can kind of democratise air travel. Now, hundreds of people in England with a life-limiting blood disorder are set to benefit from the world's first gene editing therapy after it was given the green light for NHS use by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Exocell, which is sold as Cascivy, is made by Vertex and the treatment is the first to be licensed using the gene editing tool CRISPR, which earned its inventors a Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020. It's been recommended by NICE to treat patients aged 12 and over with transfusion-dependent beta-thalassemia. Cascavi works by modifying the faulty gene in a patient's bone marrow stem cells, so the body produces functioning hemoglobin. The edited cells are then infused back into the patient. Let's go to the ads. Coming up, researchers make Julius Caesar's perfume, but are missing one key ingredient. Why not hit follow in the meantime? Give us a rating. Welcome back. Now, an army barracks in Wales is to be redeveloped to host a space radar programme with 27 mega dishes helping to protect the UK from cosmic warfare. The Deep Space Advanced Radar Capability, or DARK, based at Cordor Barracks near Haverford West, will detect, track and identify objects up to 22,000 miles away from Earth in collaboration with radar systems run by UK allies. The MOD programme, which was opposed by local campaigners on health grounds, will work with a network of ground-based radar scanners in Australia and America, as well as to provide global space monitoring, increasing the ability to track objects. As Second Science Daily podcast listeners know, despite the network's grand name, the distances they're talking about are not proper deep space. That starts over a million miles away, and the capability of the Welsh Dark facility is about a tenth of the way to the moon. Next. A 500-year-old copper alloy compass, thought to have been used by astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, has been found in the grounds of a castle in northern Poland. It was discovered by amateur archaeologists who used a ground-penetrating radar to comb the grounds of the 14th century Frombork Castle. The finds now being sent for official testing. And finally, never mind how often do you think about the Roman Empire? How about smelling like Julius Caesar, but with one crucial perfume additive missing, gladiator sweat. Researchers from the Scent and Culture Tourism Association say they've made the 2,000-year-old fragrance with reference to ancient writings and recipes. The perfume called Tellinum includes a mix of mint, rose, lemon, bergamot, lavender, jasmine, water lily, violet, oud cedarwoods and amber. However, the fabled missing ingredient was said to be a few drops of gladiator sweat to bolster the fragrance, which is currently in short supply. You're up to date. Come back at 4pm for the Standard Podcast here in London and we'll be back tomorrow, Friday at 1pm. See you then.